Meet Emily. She's a nurse. Why did she become a nurse? Because she loves helping people and because it runs in her family. Her mom is a nurse and many more in her extended family as well. They all share a passion for helping people. Emily takes pride in her job and it's especially rewarding, she says, being a nurse that goes to people's homes to care for them, to help them in their home if they're too sick or too old to go to the hospital themselves. As much as she loves her job, however, a few years ago, something happened that changed everything, that forced her to quit what she really loves doing, helping people. That particular night that changed so much started off like many nights before. Late in the evening, she got a call from a patient that was in desperate need of help. She quickly grabbed her bunch of keys, the medicine for the patient, the appropriate equipment, and the car. But being a nurse that goes on house calls also entails going through areas of the city that are kind of dangerous. So she went to the patient's home, she parked outside, but before she could get out of the car, she was attacked. She was attacked by a gang of criminals. They smashed her car window, grabbed the medicine, grabbed the equipment, and she could do nothing. Nothing but to sit paralyzed and only think about the patient in the house waiting for someone to come and help. She knew that something had to change. She couldn't go forward in this capacity, being a full-time nurse, because unfortunately, this wasn't the first time she had been attacked by either drug addicts or criminals. The first time I met Emily, she wasn't in scrubs like here. It was actually a very rainy day, one of those days when, you know, you step outside and your umbrella blows open. You know what I'm talking about, right? You know, just a horrible day. And I was running through the city trying to holler a cab. And it was just impossible because everyone else was also trying to get a cab, right? So I decided, feeling the stress to get to my appointment in time, I decided against my instinct to jump into one of these electric rickshaws that had been starting to pop up in the city. So I jumped into the rickshaw, and guess who was driving the rickshaw? It was actually Emily. So on the way to my meeting, through the narrow streets, we started chatting. And she told me about her new gig as a rickshaw driver and how much she loved it and how it made her feel to every other day meet new people. But it wasn't a full-time occupation. It was actually a gig on the side of her regular job. So what was a regular job, you might ask? It was actually being a nurse. She told me that this rickshaw extra gig had made it possible for her to go back to being a nurse. But this time around, with much more flexibility and a higher degree of freedom. Emily, just like many other people today, that are breaking away from the shackles of the nine-to-five economy, are favoring independent jobs for multiple employers at once. These Emilys of the world are called giggers. And the movement is strong. Surveys now reveal that between one in five to one in three people in the US and in Europe engage in some type of independent job. They're giggers of some sort. This means that 160 million people in the US and in Europe are now giggers. And that's a huge number. That's a whole army of giggers. In fact, it corresponds to 17 New Yorks. That's a big number. And it seems like also the movement is fueled by high demand, because when we ask organizations, 50% of organizations today report an increase in their use of giggers over the past five years. And when we look at the giggers themselves, they seem pretty happy. 70% of giggers 
say they enjoy the gig lifestyle. And two-thirds, two-thirds of the giggers say that the positive aspects of the gig lifestyle overweighs or uh, are bigger than the possible uh, drawbacks. So these giggers of the world are exchanging the nine to five jobs where they're locked into a 40 hour work week with little or no flexibility with being a nurse, a rickshaw driver. Oh, and I shouldn't forget, Emily is also a personal trainer. So a perfect paragon of a true gigger. I'm certain that the gig economy is here to stay because the gig economy is fueled by three underlying megaforces. These megaforces are urbanization, digitization, and millennization. Urbanization is a megaforce to be reckoned with. More people today live in cities than ever before. And urbanization is really a a driving force for the gig economy, because you know what? Gigs thrive in dense environments. Think about it. It's only in cities where you see giggers delivering foods on bikes. That's because it's only in cities where it's possible for a gigger to deliver dumplings from a restaurant to the consumer in time before the dumplings get cold and soggy. And let me ask you this. Raise your hand, raise your hand, if you've ever seen a rickshaw on a highway. Raise your hand. I see no hands. And that's my point. Many gigs need cities. And the second megaforce, digitization, is of course disrupting businesses and, and markets everywhere. Mobile penetration has soared almost throughout the world. And digitization will disrupt labor markets as well. One contributing reason why Emily a few years ago was forced to quit her job as a nurse, in addition to the horrible experience, of course, and the horrible incident, was that it was impossible for her to cut back on hours and combine you know, fewer, uh, fewer hours as a nurse with something else, an independent job. The old world was a very either-or type of place. Either you were a nurse or you were not a nurse. But digitization is changing this. Through our gig platforms and our smartphones, we can easily now synchronize different types of jobs with, together. On millennization, the third megaforce underlying and fueling the gig economy, I'm talking about, of course, the generational shift coming about as the new generation, the millennials, now between the ages of 19 and 36, are increasingly making their mark. The millennials will change the way we look at work and perform work. They're much more open to flexible, independent types of jobs. So in that sense, they're both increasing the supply of gigs and the demand of gigs. And I predict that the more influential the millennials will become in existing organizations as well, they will make organizations more gig-friendly and more gig-compatible. So these three reinforcing megatrends are stirring a revolution, a gig revolution. And the gig revolution will have formative impacts. Specifically, I believe that the gig revolution will have existential implications, economic implications, and social implications. On existential implications, I'm talking about the way we identify ourselves. People of the older generation, of the old world, often identify themselves through their job. I came to think about this uh, when I took on my first job many years ago as a diplomat at the Ministry for Foreign Affairs. At a conference, I had introduced myself as Andreas, working as a diplomat. This had outraged an older colleague of mine who said that, Andreas, you don't work as a diplomat, you are a diplomat. But I couldn't relate to this. I didn't identify myself through my job. And I think the gig revolution will reinforce this new way we identify ourselves. We will no longer say, 
I am my job. So in that sense, the gig revolution will push us away, liberate us from an I am state of mind to an I do state of mind. We will no longer say, I am a diplomat, I am a teacher, I am a programmer, I am a taxi driver, I am a doctor, or I am a, you know, an orangutan rehabilitation guru. And if you think some of these examples sound weird, especially in combination with each other, think again. Because just a couple of weeks ago, I met this gigger. This is Dr. Mazelan, and I met him in the virgin jungles of Borneo. He's a medical doctor by trade, but with a strong love for nature and helping the orangutans of Borneo. And instead of just being a medical doctor today, he's actually gigging his way through life, showing visitors like me around this beautiful country, also analyzing blood and bone marrow samples for cancer treatments on his smartphone. So the gig revolution is changing the way we identify ourselves. We will no longer say, I am my job, but simply if someone asks, I'm a gigger. And on economic effects, I think that the gig economy and the gig revolution will liberate us from a static type of labor model and move us into a new type of dynamic labor model. Like in the old world, it was very difficult to try out new things. To try out new things was attached with humongous risks and humongous costs. Perhaps you had to quit your job altogether just to try out a new thing. So you didn't. You were locked in to a regular type of 9 to 5 job with a 40-hour work week. I, I predict that the gig revolution will change this. It will make it possible for more people like you and me to try out new things and match different types of jobs together. And in this sense, the gig revolution will also push us into a new phase of work. I mean, come on, think about it. Since the Second World War, during the whole post-World War era, we've basically seen two types of, of phases of work. First, it was the turtle phase where people went to school and then, more or less, directly after school, they took on a job, and just like a turtle, they moved steadily, you know, forward without much drama. Many of, of these people in the turtle phase stayed on at their job for their whole life. And then we had the goldfish phase. That was the second phase of work that we've seen thus far. People stayed with a job for a few years. They stayed in the fishbowl until the fishbowl got too crowded or too boring, and then they moved on to the next fishbowl, the next type of job. But I predict that the gig revolution will kick off a new phase of work, the centipede era, where people will have a thousand feet doing multiple things at once, trying out new things at the same time for multiple employers through independent jobs. So we have the, the strong underlying mega forces driving the gig revolution. And we have these tremendous impacts. But the gig revolution, like all revolution, come, comes with pros and cons. And it will create winners as well as losers. Despite the tremendous positive benefits and impacts, there are obvious threats. One threat, as I see it, has to do with job security. Although giggers say that they love flexibility, I'm not that sure that they love not knowing exactly where their next paycheck will come from. The next threat, as I see it, has to do with the social aspects of work. Because although many millennials and giggers don't favor nine to five jobs. Nine to five jobs comes with some type of benefits. And one gift is the gift of coworkers. Because most of us, since we're, we're social creatures, we rather bear the day-to-day -day bickering of office work than to be isolated. Because while service say that 80% of giggers love flexibility of being a gigger, 
only 30% say they enjoy working from home. And that, to me, says something about the fact that the gig economy can be quite a lonely place. So how can these risks and threats be mitigated? Well, I think that we all need to focus on reinventing the traditional labor model. And this needs to be done by organizations, together with businesses, together with labor unions and giggers themselves. Everyone needs to prepare for the gig revolution. Specifically, we need to reinvent the traditional labor model, where security has been attached to those jobs that were you know, dominating the turtle and the goldfish eras. If flexibility is what giggers want, but security is what giggers need. We need to reinvent the model based on more flex security. So the gig revolution is a disruptive force. It comes with challenges, but we can make it into an opportunity for all. But to succeed, we need determination, creativity, the right focus, and the right mindset. Only then can we maximize the benefits of the gig revolution while minimizing the potential threats. Thank you.